next talk will be by Dr. Muna Bende, ma'am. Uh, she will be talking on uh, predicting the progression of dry AMD and uh, how the imaging can help us in uh, dry AMD cases. Madam needs no introduction. Uh, she is a senior veterinary surgeon from Shankar Netralaya. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Uni, for inviting me to this session, and uh, thank you for everyone who's chosen to spend their Sunday morning here with us. Uh, what we're going to try and find out in the next uh, few minutes is how do we change or how can we recognize the evolution of geographic atrophy from at risk to atrophy in the spectrum from normal aging to atrophic AMD. There has been this recent publication on prevalence and pattern of geographic atrophy in Asia and we thought we knew it all that uh, geographic atrophy is not so common in Asia as it is in the West. We were equally proud to see that there were so many studies from India, including from our own, a little confused by that number which shows that some of the cases have a higher incidence. And then when you read the entire article, you see that many of the Indian data was not even included in the final analysis due to various reasons, the way of access, the time of evaluation. And also they felt that some of the cases were outliers. So this may not exactly tell us the real picture of geographic atrophy. The Edward Memorial Jackson lecture was uh, given by Dr. Emily Chu. And she has this interesting table which shows us that as the number of known risk factors increases, like age, education, smoking, baseline AMD severity scores of the study I and fellow I and the genetic risk factors, you see that the E index, uh, the C index goes fairly high, almost up to one, which is believed to be of significance. And the uh, uh, large UK cohort also showed us that importance of the fellow I. Supposing you have. Um, sorry. Yeah, this is the study eye and the fellow eye. And if you see, if you look at the condition of the fellow eye, you see that the increase in progression to geographic atrophy increases as well. And this is an interesting paper. It says September 2023. I was a little confused as what was the year we are in, but probably this is a preprint. And it shows us there are various risk factors in terms of incidence of geographic atrophy and expansion of geographic atrophy. Certain risk factors are shared, certain are not shared, certain, certain are uncertain. And some of them are exactly in the opposite direction, which indicates that we have a lot to learn as far as progression of geographic atrophy is concerned and more of interest because now we have the complement inhibitors which are being uh, studied and getting FDA approval as well. The RH2 had an ancillary SDOCT calculator for risk of AMD and it shows that there was one single factor that was important both in terms of new onset central atrophy and new onset geographic atrophy and this was the presence of RP layer atrophy or absence. If it was present at start, the risk of atrophy was higher than if it was absent at the start of the study. We know these are the precursor lesions, but how long do they take to reach geographic atrophy? Hypopigmentation, surprisingly, is the shortest, whereas large confluent rusin, which is something we all recognize, takes almost about six and a half to seven years before it progresses to geographic atrophy. And these are the various imaging protocols that we now use, color fundus photography, which is okay in pigmented eyes because we can recognize it well. Fundus autofluorescence, we all know we are able to recognize atrophic changes with loss of FAF and study of the junctional zone. Near infrared reflectance, and now there's a lot of importance on, on OCT because it is able to show us choroidal hypertransmission very well. And the... Uh, uh, Atrophy study group, the multimodal imaging of non-neovascular age-related macular degeneration showed that there was a grading of atrophy here, it goes in reverse, where D1 is the earliest sign when there's incomplete loss of outer layers, moving on to the most extreme, that is A1, complete RP and outer retinal atrophy or CROR. And what most of the studies now try to do is 
stop the conversion from incomplete to complete RP and outer retinal atrophy. They also de demonstrated the junctional zone between the area of uh, atrophy and the normal area. And they found there were three patterns and the irregular pattern and the splitting here where you have some inter intact areas, some split here. These are the two that were at higher risk of progression to atrophy. What else can we do? You have to look very carefully at the OCT and you find that changes in internal reflectivity of the drusen, here you see it is a little high reflective as it moves further, there is a low reflectivity of the drusen, outer retinal hyperreflective foci, these are high risk for progression to atrophy. And outer retinal tubulations, though we take it as a negative biomarker, is actually believed to be a protective factor when it is at the edge of the lesion. These are some of my own cases. Here you see this uh, patient, you have some hyperreflectivity here, you have choroidal hypertransmission, and over a period of time you see there is atrophy. And this is the Another location, the same patient, this is another area where you see development of hyperreflective spots in the outer layer overlying the drusen. And you see over a period of time, the drusenoid PED enlarging in size, it becomes larger and then it flattens down. This is another eye showing a little bit of hyperreflectivity that flattens down after a year. So these are changes that may be there somewhere in the fundus and you need to have a careful OCT examination. What is more important is recognition of autofluorescence patterns at the junction of atrophy and normal retina. And these patterns of banded autofluorescence where you have hyperautofluorescence around the lesion or this branching or trickling pattern of autofluorescence indicating widespread outer layer disturbance are more at high risk. This is another patient of mine. You see this is when the patient started out and this is the B-scan OCT showing this intermittent interrupted pattern of disruption of the outer layer, choroidal hypertransmission. You see a couple of years later, there is a definite increase in loss of autofluorescence. But you look at it two months later, it's not changed. This indicates that geographic atrophy is slow to worsen. It doesn't happen overnight. And this is again the fellow eye of the patient. You see the small area of atrophy. Look carefully at the border. This is what I meant as the branching or trickling pattern of hyperautofluorescence at the border, indicating that this patient has a higher risk of progression of geographic atrophy. And this is one year down the line. You see this area has increased from here to here. So these are the various uh, patterns of, uh, in, of imaging patients with geographic atrophy, and these are the high risk factors. You have larger areas of geographic atrophy, multiple areas of geographic atrophy, an irregular or a multifocal configuration, extra foveal geographic atrophy, all these have high risk for progression. And you have the area of banded or trickled hyperautofluorescence at the borders. Another condition we are uh, able to notice the area of choroidal hypertransmission. We've seen it on the B scan images. You can also see it on the ANFAS image. And in this study, they show beautifully the area of increase of choroidal hypertransmission that occurs over the years. We did talk about uh, vitelliform lesions and how important they are. We should know that vitelliform lesions are you know, avascular, as you see here, this is an acquired vitelliform deposit in a patient with AMD. Over a period of few months, it just flattens and becomes atrophic. This is another patient where we see hyperreflectivity on the surface of Drusenot PED gradually increasing with time. Forgive me because the plexilite is, goes in reverse. So you see here the areas of hyperreflectivity on the surface of the Drusen. And you see now at almost three years down the line, the whole thing has flattened out. So once you see those changes on the surface, don't get confused that it's neovascular AMD. It's just a precursor of uh, geographic atrophy. Sometimes you find these little caps of fluid on the surface of a drusenoid PD, exudation from an avascular PD, and this is also an indication that the PD is eventually going to flatten down as what happened in the left eye of this patient, and the right eye followed suit another year later. 
in it's a very elderly person with geographic atrophy and you see over follow up the area of the drusenoid pd increasing with size you see the same thing happening in the left eye it becomes larger and eventually flattens out so increasing size of the pd and presence of hyperreflective dots on the surface are not indicators of neovascularization it could be that yes it is going to flatten down eventually and it usually takes about 4 to 5 years for this to happen this is a patient with a very long follow up from the year 2007 you see there are periods where he had evidence of fluid on the surface of a large pd which was growing in size no evidence of neovascularization look here there are small uh, i just take a couple of uh, seconds more there are small areas of discontinuity and hypertransmission on the surface of the pigment epithelial detachment which is not a rip because the configuration is maintained and over this 12 year period you see he had multiple episodes of ripping and flattening of the pd and now 12 years down the line is a totally area of atrophic retina so pigment epithelial detachment can behave in very different ways i will just end now I'm sorry another risk factor is patients with early onset large drusen you may see a patient at age 30 with large drusen this is not amd this early onset large drusen but they can have geographic atrophy very much earlier so these are the lesion characteristics identified as prognostic for geographic atrophy progression high evidence is a larger baseline lesion size multifocal lesions perilesional autofluorescence patterns and non foveal locations there are uh, higher progression rates greater extent of abnormal higher fluorescence which are areas which are of moderate evidence and i'll just end this i, I love this comparison of uh, geographic atrophy incidence versus progression and comparing it with charles dickens story of a tale of two cities where there are two sentences we know that I tell thee, said Madame, that although it is a long time on the road, it's on the road and coming. I tell thee, it never retracts and never stops. I tell thee, it's always advancing, which is what we think of geographic atrophy. But what we want to know is the answer to this question. It does not take a long time to strike a man with lightning, but how long does it take to make and store the lightning? And hopefully, by next year, us will have some answer for this. Thank you very much, and welcome to Chennai in June. Yeah, ma'am. Can I have one question, uh, ma'am? Uh, regarding the patient with the very long follow-up, so once once it developed uh, the sliver of fluid on top of the PD, so what did you decide to do at that point in time? Actually, nothing, because patient had FFA and ICG. We knew that uh, there was no neovascular component, and you can see those RP apertures, which is now something that you see little breaks on the surface. or you see that rp is getting degenerated you see a change in color on the surface is pigmentation so you know it's not uh, neovascularization this was unusual because every time he ripped a thing would go down and then it would come up now there's nothing left to rip so i think it's <laughs> staying yeah. as an extension to what he asked uh, in that scenario uh, i i ho- i hope you remember the case which i recently presented uh in uh, we we had two scenarios one with fluid and uh shrem fluid and vitelliform so uh you in a, in the case which i presented i mean icg didn't pick up the i mean what do you th- i mean what do you think is the role of octa in these lesions now i would be uh doing octa but if you see this was 2007 Yeah. and i'd use the yeah, colored right. image yeah now i would probably do octa look a little carefully but usually fluid on the surface and uh, there is a recent publication i think rcbr this year which tells us that these apertures are progress uh, precursor to geographic atrophy yeah because the case which i had had a normal icg and uh, the manual i showed uh, sub rp segmentation showed a flimsy uh, membrane there actually yeah. so i i do agree with you on uh, the the role of octa and manual segmentation just in case the mimicker may have a subtle membrane uh, unlike the cases which you present yeah. and also the second case of the acquired vitelliform 
Actually, I had uh, done an octa. I think I picked up a segmentation artifact. I do not know. I thought that I would give an injection. Then the gentleman said, let's think about it. And then he came back and the whole thing had flattened. So I think in acquired vitelliform is a little difficult to, we may end up over treating because of the segmentation artifacts. There's another scenario where instead of the PED, you have fluid associated with just geographic atrophy. I mean, uh, obviously these are cases, again, we call them non-neovascular SRF, but uh, in the presence of geographic atrophy, saying whether octa, there is a membrane or not is extremely difficult. Are there any uh, clues or tips by which we can diagnose that? A cystic space directly over an area of octa of a geographic atrophy, then I wouldn't worry much. But if the cystic space or the fluid is away from the area of geographic atrophy, then I would be worried. In fact, one of the patients I didn't show for lack of time, he developed a CNVM at the edge, whereas this area eventually flattened. So I think it's where yeah. the fluid yeah, is. On the autofluorescence which you showed, beautiful images, with the descriptive of uh, um, you know geographic atrophy and its progression. Is there any way where you can uh, quantify, how do you, I mean, uh, the progression, is there a way of measurement or quadrant wise, uh, is there any way of, uh, you know, looking at the, just that qualitatively enlargement, but that takes a long time, uh, you know, uh, is there any uh, thing? That I think quantitative autofluorescence has begun, but I am not sure how much it has taken up. It is possible to measure the area. There is quantitative autofluorescence. I think not yet reached its uh, popularity. Probably not, uh, maybe not, uh, you cannot replicate it. Mm -hmm. time, so. You can use calipers to measure yeah. it. You can just use, if you are measuring the area, you can easily use calipers and measure the area of autofluorescence and document it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, autofluorescence can be measured. In fact, there is a, they have tried to measure it on the OCT also. But the OCT is more difficult to measure it. It gives you it quickly. Yeah. But uh, the measurement which has been done by the CAMS group, I think it has been done on autofluorescence. And if you can't do it on your image analysis thing, you can just Im export your images to the J image photo. This is that uh, similar conversion to image J. Slide has to come. Okay. So we can do it. You can use the freehand tool to measure the area. Thank you, ma'am, for that uh, great uh, talk on that. Quite a difficult but uh, 